phenomenology, dark matter phenomenology. Uh, he's professor at the University of Southampton, and he's also worked very closely with the CMS experiment at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. And today he will discuss towards the consistent dark matter exploration. Thank you for your time, Alexander. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you. First of all, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. And this is really a pleasure to open this semester. So it's a really pleasure and honor. Uh, well, uh, just a few words about myself. Uh, so yes, I'm the, the uh, staff member at University of Southampton. I'm also a member of the, the NEXT Institute. Well, I like you sub, sub fear abbreviation. That's very cool, by the way, and nice picture, nice poster. So the NEXT uh, also stands something. It's not just the NEXT. It's new interactions between experimentalists and theorists. This is NEXT. So this is design I created a long time ago when I joined NEXT. And uh, I was the first uh, NEXT member, well, the faculty member besides director, who is Stefano Moretti and vice director, who is Claire Sheffield from uh, uh, Rutherford Lab. So, uh, and this connection is very important. Otherwise, if, if you don't test, verify your theory, the theory uh, still remains philosophy, right? So we need uh, to, to test it. So what I will be talking about, I will be talking about dark matter. Uh, so first slide, I just want to say that uh, uh, this slide shows the trends in particle physics. Uh, and the trends are reflected by number of papers, number of publications in Inspire. And you can see that besides dark matter, which is leading one, there's a few leading things like uh, uh, Higgs, there's Suzy, there's the top, well, extra dimensions dropping. Well, but still uh, quite a few publications. Well, uh, and second thing I just want to mention, I send you slides in the chat of my talk. So you come back and forth, back and forth. So in case you would like to have a question, so please uh, do ask them. And you're welcome to ask questions right away during the talk because maybe you forget about the question. So I'm happy to, answering, to answer your question during my talk. This is the really uh, the most intense and healthy way to communicate and learn something if you just communicate during the talk. So please, uh, well, uh, do not, uh, well, ask questions. There are, it's, there are no thousand people online. So there's only like of the order of say 20 or like, so you can always ask questions, please. So uh, there are trends. And uh, it's not surprising, therefore, uh, I will talk about dark matter. And uh, if we talk about, uh, well, in general, what we have, I like very much uh, this, uh, well, this picture, especially the picture presenting standard model as a piece of the bigger puzzle. This was uh, one of the, um, I think, editor or, well, art artist editor of CERN Courier, who, well, created this, uh, plot, I, sorry, I forgot his name, but yes, th this is from him. Uh, uh, and um, when, when the Higgs was discovered. So it's really great, one of my favorites. So Higgs indeed completing the standard model, but standard model itself is, uh, um, well, is the piece of the bigger theory. Why? Because we know for sure that uh, the origin of the, of, of the matter antimatter asymmetry should be explained. And even standard model has ingredients like CP violation, it's not enough. Uh, and I'm not going, going to discuss this in details. The, uh, well, aesthetic problem fine tuning is still standard model because the Higgs is the pain if it's elementary particle and the nature of Higgs boson is still not confirmed. If, if it's elementary or fundamental, if it's, uh, 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 sorry, if, it, if it's elementary composite, <laughs> well, uh, if it's uh, elementary, maybe supersymmetry will help. When it's composite, uh, the fine tuning could be naturally explained. Well, dark matter problem, and of course, uh, uh, connection to God coupling unification should be uh, also aesthetically maybe explained. And, then we have something uh, recent, which is uh, flavor anomalies and G minus two, which actually stands for 
15 years, it's st still get, get uh, we're getting from Z minus two of muon on the order of about four sigma. And of course, neutrinos could, uh, which could also connect us to the new physics. And in fact, there's a big hint from neutrinos about the physics beyond the stellar model. Not discovery, but hints. I can mention uh, point point. Well, uh, I'll clarify what I mentioned later on. Uh, now, if we build uh, BSM theory, we all want to build our favorite BSM theory. This theory, of course, need to be gauge invariant, renormalizable, and anomaly free. Well, this means that first you need to incorporate dark matter with a certain Z2 symmetry. And uh, there is an upper limit on dark matter mass from relative density eventually, because if it's thermal, then, uh, well, the, the heavier dark matter, the, um, the uh, larger relative density. Well, and it provides certain LHC signatures, including mono X, mono, uh, mono X, invisible Higgs decay, even Z prime as a mediator, et cetera, et cetera. I'll mention about this. Then uh, we need to still understand what is the nature of the Higgs. And if the Higgs is composite, you, you can have some uh, resonances like could, which could appear uh, from the technicolor model, composite Higgs model, decaying to Higgs and W, for example. And again, uh, there is a limit on this. And well, there is a lot of searches for these signatures. And finally, uh, well, we need to explain Z minus two of muon, anomalous magnetic of muon and the flavor anomalies. And they also predict kind of a lip different leptonic signature because there is a coupling to leptons. Lepto quarks, again, Z primes are the mediator to, to explain different anomalies, etc. So finally, if you manage to build all ingredients of your theory, you can see that these circles, they kind of intercept in one point, they must be. And then you say, well, if you manage to do this, then you have your theory, favorite theory, which explains everything. And this is at least would be one theory to look for. Well, how many of them? There could be quite a few. So uh, I will start from dark matter uh, side. So I'm not going to convince you to, uh, that dark matter existence is confirmed by several independent observations, uh, starting from rotation curves, uh, CMB, large scale structure, uh, well, uh, simulations, bullet cluster, gravitational lensing. And this picture is established as a, well, quite precisely uh, with the dark matter density measured with the precision better than 1%. So establishing standard model of cosmology quite well. Now, uh, but what do, do we know about this, uh, about dark matter? Actually, we don't, we, we know nothing except it <laughs> interacts gravitationally. All these questions about speed mass, the symmetry behind stability or involvement in other interactions, whether it's thermal or not, they're all questions. And we need to understand what it is. So, uh, well, just to mention that I have, uh, uh, well, very lucky with my collaborators, which are helping me to, well, understand how we can decode this dark matter uh, properties and, and understand what the dark matter actually is hidden in the underlying model. And there are quite a few uh, of them, including, well, those who are in the audience. Now, uh, how we can explore and decode the nature of dark matter? Of course, the uh, we need the signal first, which we don't. But uh, yeah, and this is quite disappointing. But what we can do at the moment is to understand what kind of dark matter already excluded. So not spend time on developing uh, and exploring these models. We can explore and systematize, systematize uh, dark matter theory space to prepare ourselves for discovery and uh, decoding of dark matter. Now, uh, well, this is famous connection between dark matter and different uh, ways to detect. So if you go along this line, the dark matter would annihilate uh, either in the early universe or now leading, giving the direct detection. So I'm going to vertical direction. If you go to in the horizontal direction, then uh, dark matter can scatter on the standard model particles, means protons or neutrons. And uh, well, uh, direct detection experiments like xenon or 
or Lux or LZ future will will be uh, well looking at this. And if you go to from bottom up, so it means that standard model can then relate to dark matter and effectively create dark matter equalizers. And the message here is that uh, well, basically it's complementarity of dark matter searches, which means that there is no hundred percent correlation between signatures I just mentioned be, 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 between channels I mentioned. Why? Because, for example, take this model like in front of you. This is dark matter interacts with W and Z, for example, or dark matter as a scalar again interaction with uh, W Z vector scalar. So uh, there would be no three level diagrams in this case uh, uh, for dark matter scattering on a nuclei, right? And uh, only loop uh, suppressed diagrams. But uh, so this means that you would be able to discover dark matter maybe in colliders, uh, well, from uh, double bottom fusion, but not with the high rate at the direct detection experiment because it, the, the, the rates, uh, direct, the direct detection experiments will be loop su suppressed. Loop suppression still allow to access some dark matter models, but it will be uh, much less rates. Any questions so far? Looks like no questions. Yeah, please go ahead. Interrupt me anytime. So dark matter candidates. Uh, so uh, for dark matter candidates, uh, I would like to uh, uh, mention one thing. Uh, so uh, there is a huge parameter space uh, for uh, dark matter mass and the cross section. And the cross section, uh, of course, what I am interested in in, in dark matter mass are related to uh, well, kind of WIMP, weakly interacting massive particles. And as an example, because I'm I'm going to discuss decoding of dark matter, and uh, the best way to decode is to involve different experiments. Though uh, thermal dark matter mass range still quite large, it could be from MeV to hundreds of TeV, but I will be talking about the some kind of somewhat accessible ranges for different experiments. So before discussing uh, ranges and experiments, I just want to mention tools. Tools are important to, to connect the model and collider signatures or direct detection signatures. And these are all tools which we know the moment starting from farm and rule generation, matrix element generators, and uh, beyond the partner level uh, simulation, etc. If you have any questions, please do ask me. What's important is are two packages uh, which interface to CalHEP, uh, which called MicroMagas, which uh, uh, evaluate relic density dark matter direct detection and MATDM based on the MAT graph, which evaluates relic density and dark matter direct detection. Well, MicroMagus also evaluate dark matter indirect detection. And I don't know about the latest version of MATDM, maybe it also can do can deal with the indirect detection. I don't know, I, I, I was not aware about this. One more thing, you can actually, well, comment if you know. Well, one more thing, uh, uh, it's uh, constraints from CMB. CMB constraints in the actual dark matter indirect detection, but it's more uh, coming from uh, uh, dark, mat dark matter indirect detection at the CMB time, when uh, the calculation and model dependence on the propagation of dark matter decay products uh, in the universe, it's much less because there are no structures, there's no galaxies, there's no planets and dark matter effect in dark matter in, uh, annihilation and its effect to CMB is much clean. That's why I like this, but this should be implemented in both MicroMagas and MacDM. I just want to mention that, uh, ah, yes, uh, here there are analysis frameworks besides this, uh, with Checkmate, MAD Analysis, Revit, Attempt, etc., which can connect collider signatures and uh, uh, dark matter signatures. Also very important frameworks analysis. Uh, analysis tools as a framework. Now, CMB constraint, I just want to briefly mention that, um, well, what's the point? So when dark matter annihilates uh, at the CMB time, it can affect uh, the process of recombination. And uh, this effect is very unambiguous, so you can calculate this. 
And when you calculate this, you're essentially setting the limit on, on the sigma v, where a sigma, the cross section of dark matter annihilation, is, and v is the velocity, especially for the models that, uh, well, ex ex exhibit large Zomerfeld effect, but not necessarily. Zomerfeld effect when you have a massive char, uh, well, kind of dark matter, which uh, may be having some dark charge and interacts uh, with, with each other by, by enhancement of the, like uh, the teacher like changes. Well, but not necessarily the case is still, there is a, some a limit and very important limits on dark matter from even, uh, even normal uh, dark matter from CMB. So it's important to incorporate this and we're actually using this limit in our analysis. Any questions? All right. So uh, now evolution of uh, neutralina relic density or dark matter relic density. So, well, this is the evolution of thermal dark matter uh, density where described by Boltzmann equation. And at some point when the temperature is high, well, eventually there is equilibrium between dark matter and model particles. But when the temperature drops below dark matter mass, I hope you see my pointer, right? So, right, okay. You do hope, yeah. Tell me if you don't. So the, uh, this is the pointer in in, in uh, well, I'm pointing. We do. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so when the temperature is less than mass of dark matter, the equilibrium is broken and the, the whole game starts. So the uh, the temperature at which uh, dark matter frees out depends on the sigma times v, and uh, when the equilibrium, well, when the Hubble expansion is equal to the uh, to the reaction rate, then the freeze out uh, uh, stops. You can see that the higher rate, uh, the higher rate, the uh, uh, well, the, the, the later this happens. So basically, uh, the, the higher uh, the higher uh, sigma times v, the smaller freeze out temperature. Uh, so the lower uh, uh, the, uh, then uh, the, 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 the low relic density is, right? So essentially the rule of thumb is very simple. The relic density is inversely proportional to sigma times V. This is the cross section of annihilation of dark matter times velocity. This is effective cross section because it, it does depend on the velocity because velocity uh, defines intensity of the dark matter meeting, right? So the, 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 the higher velocity, the more intense the process. That's why it's convolution of sigma times V, uh, times student coefficient, which comes from the Boltzmann evolution. So you can see the omega and sigma V are inversely proportional. Now, uh, well, and typically for, well, for GV or 100 GV of dark matter, the freeze out temperature is mass of dark matter over 25. This is kind of rule of thumb again. There are several packages which does this, uh, which do this, uh, including Micromegas, MATDM, Dark Suzy, and Isared. Isared, this is the old program which I written when I was PG, uh, not PG, but postdoc, my first postdoc a long time ago. And um, well, what it does, it just calculates the uh, these diagrams. With these diagrams, in, in, in involve on, not only annihilation of dark matter. You need to also. Uh, uh, well, calculate uh, co annihilation dark matter if uh, uh, the other particle closed, uh, well, odd particles in this particle soup close to dark matter mass, then there is no exponential suppression. And um, yeah, and number of diagrams uh, in case of SUSIP, for example, is of the order of thousand. This is example of few diagrams, but number of processes you need to calculate accurately is of the order of thousand. That's why we need to have a micro megas package. So if you get this formula and is, uh, you can immediately calculate, uh, since you know omega chi, the relic density of dark matter, which is very well measured by, uh, well, Planck, uh, we, know, we know what is the sigma AV should be, and it's of the order of one picobar. If you know this uh, cross-section times velocity averaged, and you assume the simplistic diagram by dimensional analysis, which is pi alpha squared a m squared, and assuming that dark matter weakly interact, you immediately find the mass for dark matter, which is 100 GeV. Well, this means that it's quite amazing. That's called, well, uh, the, um, 
uh, WIMP miracle. So you get you are predicting the mass of the mediator or dark matter mass roughly uh, of the order of uh, 100 GeV. Well, is it right? Is it possible? The answer yes. Dark matter can be 100 GeV, and there is a possibility that we still don't observe it. So it can be really at the, right around the corner, and we're expecting to discover it, and we're expecting to detect uh, to decode it. That's why it's super cool time now when you expecting any time to discover it. Now the question is that uh, why we don't see honey GV dark matter? So I'll, I'll mention about this. There are several reasons for this. And uh, well, before before I discuss this, I just want to mention that uh, direct detection is a very powerful way to direct dark matter. And um, well, what it is, dark matter scatters on the nuclei, recoil and nuclear uh, nuclear exhibit recoil and recalling of the nuclei, uh, well, uh, cause ionization, ionization being detected and certain spectrum ionization is being uh, quite identified with the, uh, well, uh, against the background, very, very, uh, very different, which is actually quite different from background. The important thing in all this game is so-called reduced mass. The energy, recall energy is proportional to the scattering angle and uh, uh, well, the mass of the nuclei, which is mn, velocity. Of course, it's proportional to velocity squared. The, the high velocity, the high energy. Uh, well, to be more precise, is velocity squared, of course. Well, classical uh, mechanics, but also mass, reduced mass. What is the uh, nuclei? Nuclei is the product of the uh, nuclear mass and uh, mass of the dark matter divided by their sum, which means that if if the mass of dark matter is too high, then uh, mu is reduced to be one. Essentially, it's uh, sorry, mu is reduces to be uh, uh, equal to uh, uh, is es essentially uh, to, to to be uh, mass of the nuclei, right? So because this is uh, large, large, and you cancel, so uh, the effective uh, mu chi n just mass of the nuclei. However, if mass of dark matter is small, we're in trouble. Why? Because uh, this small mass of dark matter uh, cause uh, uh, this coefficient to be zero. And then you under the threshold of the uh, uh, detector sensitivity and you don't observe nothing. But even increasing of mass of dark matter to be large and making uh, mu constant to be equal to mass of the nucleus, it's still not good because you're still losing sensitivity. So if I just, uh, uh, well, th this is astrophysical dependent. I, I just mentioned, mentioned this, that there are two factors also, the particle physics, when you calculate the rate of the scattering uh, dark matter nuclei and uh, astrophysics, which uh, involve the distribution of dark matter, uh, the mass distribution, the velocity distribution of dark matter. And I just want to mention that you can see that even if you take the xenon, this is like the xenon data, you can see that sensitivity of the experiment, uh, this is the limit on the, uh, on the dark matter scattering on the proton cross section, you see sensitivity drops. Why? Any ideas? Well, it's just simply because uh, the, uh, the uh, increase of, uh, if you fix the relic density, then increase of mass of dark matter just means that there are less dark matter particles in certain volume, which means that there are less particle flow, uh, uh, less particle flux. That's why the sensitivity drops. Even the uh, cross section uh, with the, for the constant flux, sensitivity is the same. But if you take into account dark matter flux, which is dropping with the increase of dark matter mass, then you, you see the, uh, the drop of sensitivity of the of the of the uh, dark matter detection experiment. Now, um, what else I wanted to say? I wanted to say that uh, the uncertainties from local uh, relic density cause this limit. This is example of the Lux collaboration, but this is the uh, well. This line, the same for for xenon or any other direct detection experiment. The line will be jumping up and down uh, according to uncertainties, say factor of like maybe 40, 50 percent from local relic density uncertainties. If uh, 
there is uncertainties uh, from a dark matter velocity distribution coming from simulation, then uh, the line limit will be floating uh, left, right. And in the end, you can have, well, quite a factor of several uncertainty in the, in the detection if you combine left, right, and up and down fluctuation. Well, this uh, understanding of uncertainty was related to, of course, the Dama puzzle, and it boosted the exploration of all these uncertainties. But I'm not discussing Dama, which is not consistent with, looks like it's not consistent with the current, well, experiments which are designed to test Dama. But I'm not discussing this. If, if you like, we can discuss this, but uh, not in the current talk, maybe later on. Sasha, I have a question concerning the, the yes. previous slide. Uh, from the uh, limits from the direct detection experiments. So here, um, that one. So what happens, I mean, when once you hit the neutrino floor, my understanding is that you won't be able to distinguish dark matter from neutrinos, right? So, so how critical it is to push well, the sensitivity? Uh, the, the point is that you can still play on this uh, because it depends on what do, how do you define neutrino floor? Well, a neutrino floor, is it related to one neutrino, or two neutrinos, how many neutrinos you would observe from and for which for time. So basically, uh, you can play a little bit and maybe uh, go sli slightly. Well, th this definition of neutrino floor is defined within like factor of several, I would say, right? So, and you can still go sli slightly down. But besides this, uh, you can still use directional dark matter detection because neutrino floor uh, we are talking about neutrino coming from sun right and it's here but uh, you can always uh, in pr in principle and this uh, research is being done you can think about uh, uh, that dark matter would come not from the sun uh, it comes from the well uh, direction of the kind of our sun is going through the a dark matter halo, right, in our galaxy. And there is a certain direction of dark matter wind, if you like, which is different from direction of neutrinos from the sun. And there are ideas, and it's quite realizable, that you can detect neutrinos, as you can detect the dark matter with direction. And it, this direction can be different from solar neutrinos. In this way, you can distinguish uh, dark matter from solar neutrinos, even if you're here, if you have enough statistics, right? So that's the idea. So it's directional dark matter detection experiments. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Sasha, may I ask you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. In case of uh, uh, direct neutrino uh, direct dark matter detection, what could be a, a mass of uh, uh, the detector? Uh, to uh, to hit the neutrino uh, neutrino very, flow. very good very, very good point so uh, this LZ would be uh, already uh, uh, very close to uh, um, well neutrino floor and uh, LZ as I understand we're talking about the five six ton of uh, xenon right so and uh, so this is one ton this is five ton let's just extrapolate, right? So the one ton xenon, uh, uh, then well, say five ton uh, allows to go by one order of magnitude, right? So I would say, or oh, the order of 25, 20 tons would allow you to hit the neutrino floor. Yeah, but then uh, the energy resolution is uh, going down with the, uh, with the mass of the detector. Uh, the energy resolution. What what do you mean? Uh, why do you? Think well, you yeah, but uh, to uh, uh, ah, okay. This is uh, for uh, uh, for high masses. Actually, so you, I, just, you, yeah. you count. You it, count events. You count yeah, yeah, events. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank so, you. So, answering your question, it's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, I would say that 20, 25 tons, but but rough estimation of the theorist. Well, I'm not. But uh, usually, when you do back on the envelope calculation is roughly is correct so <laughs> i would say so yeah. yes uh, let's let's say 20 ton something like this well uh thank you yeah it's great that you're asking questions i really appreciate it. yeah i feel i feel well, you, well the, the whole point is that when you uh, talk in the audience uh then you feel your presence 
And uh, here I'm talking to my screen. And well, it's good that you asked, uh, asking questions. So collider searches. Uh, so for collider searches, uh, uh, what we do, we produce dark matter from, we can learn energy of collider to dark matter. But what do you observe if you just have this process? So two, two, two. So two particles collide produced to, to dark matter. What do you observe in detector? Actually, you observe nothing because two dark matter are invisible. You need something else. And of course, uh, well, our community was clever enough to in invent well, uh, the process, well, to consider the next leading process, uh, well, with the radiation of one particle, say gluon or photon, then what you observe, you observe high PT jet uh, recalling uh, monojet, uh, sorry, recalling a large missing PT from dark matter. So this dashed line is coming from two dark matter particles. And this is quite clean signature, though uh, it's quite rare because the, the high PT request, the smaller cross section is. The question is, using this simple signature, can we say something about uh, dark matter uh, properties? Looks like it's very difficult, right? It's just one kind of PT, uh, well, PT distribution of this high PT jet or high PT photon. But actually, there is an interesting thing that the answer is yes, we can say something. And we ask ourselves, can we actually distinguish dark matter spin by looking at the monojet signature. So we consider effective models, just it, 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 this uh, analysis that, uh, applies to any model, but effective model parameterized by one parameter, it's much easier to, do, to kind of deal with. So we have effective model and effective interaction is shown by this blob, by this point, and a phi scalar chi Fermi and V vector. So the, all, the, all this stuff. So now the question is that, can we distinguish their properties? And when we uh, simulated and plotted the PT distribution, or well, at first I just maybe comment uh, what, what does mean. So we, we can talk about uh, underlying theories which contributing to all these operators uh, in terms of, well, C operator, C is the scalar dark matter. This is just not my invention. It's just from previous literature. We just use this notation. So when you have effective uh, operator, this is the, uh, well, uh, dimension uh, six operator and with some uh, well, new scalar mediator, uh, whether the T-channel process again, uh, well, D is the uh, Fermi dark matter. Again, you have a kind of a dimension six operator with a vector or scalar mediator. Uh, and uh, there is a, some tensor, uh, D, D9, uh, D10, there is a, well, uh, kind of tensor st structure for, for operator of, uh, involving standard model quarks. So there are all different notations and uh, we just explore all of them in, in one plot. So we, we plot all of them and we found very interesting thing that the PT distribution for some operators, especially for vector dark matter, is much flatter than PT distribution of scalar uh, dark matter um, distribution, distributions for scalar dark matter. So it's quite, it's quite very, it's very significant difference. And this was one of the kind of striking point that say, okay, we can distinguish maybe the properties of dark matter, but we, we, we've been trying to understand why this happens. And to understand why this happens, we look at the invariant mass of dark matter and let's take a group of operators. So this is the C1, D1, V1, which is similar because the current of dark matter, so the current uh, of the uh, standard model operator is scalar. There's a scalar current, Q, Q bar, Q, Q bar, Q, Q bar. This is the vector current, and this is the tensor current. And uh, what we fix, we fix the invariant mass of dark matter for each of the uh, group, for example, for scalar uh, current, core current, for all of them, uh, we fixed uh, dark matter, invariant mass of dark matter coming in the final state uh, to be say 500. And amazingly, all of them, uh, which is presented by dot, dash and solid line. So C1, D1, V1, for example, let's take a look at, um, Actually, the, the gray line, so the, this one, this is the gray color, 
they amazingly lie on the same line. So the PT distribution for all these operators, if you fix invariant mass of dark matter, is identical. Now, if you increase mass of dark matter to invariant mass of dark matter pair to one TV, this gray goes to black and again, identical. And uh, if you increase invariant mass of dark matter, uh, the distribution becomes uh, less steep. It becomes flatter. And the same true for all other operators. The difference between say red, uh, uh, red, blue uh, is a different structure. For, for example, C3D5, this is the vector structure. And uh, these are, this corresponds to uh, red color. And D, D9V5, this is the tensor. The, the structure are different, they also affect the, um, the, the flatness. What's the reason for this? The reason is very, uh, well, it's a very simple kinematical reason. If you have a small invariant mass of dark matter in the final state and large PT kick from this gluon, then this gluon change significantly the X1, X2 Bjorken variables in the part and density, in the part and densities. And part and density falls quickly, quicker with the X1, X2. So if you change X1, X2 variable in Bjorken in the, in the uh, part and densities by big amount, then uh, the cross section drops quite significantly because dark matter relative invariant mass is kind of small. However, if dark matter invariant mass is large and you radiate some extra jet, the overall change in the invariant mass of the system and the X1, X2 is not very significant. So if the change of X1, X2 is small, then part and density function does not change and, and does, not, does not change quickly and does not drop significantly. And that's why the slope is much more modest for large invariant mass configuration than for small invariant mass configuration, okay? This is essential point. So uh, you can digest it, we can come to this quickly and yeah, uh, later, later on. So now- A question, just, uh, just, just a brief question. So this, what you just showed, this doesn't include any detector effects? It's just- No, no, no. On no, the Carlo? Pure kinematics, it's pure okay. kinematic. Uh, uh, so basically, suppose you have a invariant mass of dark matter, small invariant mass of dark matter, right? And it requires certain X1, X2 variable from part and density because we're talking about the proton-proton collision. This is Bjorken variables in, in part and density, right? So X1, X2 from proton. The amount of fraction of momentum which carried by these two quarks, right? So X1, this quark, and X2, this quark. Now, uh, if uh, you require the system to radiate a large amount, uh, large amount of PT. So let's uh, uh, let's think about. Uh, sorry for this ambulance sound. This is my desktop. It's quite old. It's overloaded. But yeah, I'll, I'll try to. Uh, actually, I will uh, switch off the Dropbox, and I, I hope I hope that I will unload the system more, so it will be no sound. Yes. So. Uh, let, let me repeat, that's a very good question. So if uh, uh, the invariant mass of dark matter is small and you already did something hard, right? Some, something like, well, this gluon, something hard, you increase uh, the, the whole invariant mass of the system, but big, big amount because this gluon is hard, right? So the whole invariant mass increases by a lot. This means that X1, X2 variables, they, they should change by a lot. And that's why, uh, the part and uh, density function drops quite visibly. But if the invariant mass of the system like below is already large, uh, like with dark matter invariant mass is large, then the radiating jet does not change this uh, large mass by a lot, does not change the whole invariant mass of the system by a lot. That's why the, the X1, X2 change is modest and small. That's why part and density function does not drop much because the change of X and y, X1, X2 are small. So the way that, you are defining the missing energy so comes only from the dark matter final states. Uh, this yes, is the yes. assumption. 
the the the, the yes uh, the missing energy missing mass uh, missing mass uh, the, this is mass uh, m dm dm is invariant mass of dark matter yes and it and it comes from uh, only dark matter yes perfect thanks so uh, what's the practical uh, practical thing from this? this? This is essential point. We actually been working on this one year or two years and realized that everything we published before can be explained by this effect. And what we've published before are related, for example, this paper, which we published before that study. So we studied the compressed mass spectrum when you have Chodrina neutralina and Chodrina neutralina mass gap say one JV, two JV, very small. This means that Chirgina here in this diagram decays to neutralina with extremely small mass virtual W, say few JV. If the <coughs> mass of W is just few JV and it decays to electron and neutrino, this electron will be not detected because electron with the energy of one JV, talking about detector effects, will not be visible. It will not be effectively recon reconstructed. So, all this picture boils down to the just uh, in in the end chi chi not chi not production. Even if chi not chi not coming from chi plus, this means that you apply directly monojet signature to this process because chi plus and chi not very degenerate. They, they. Now, uh, if you plot PT distributions uh, of this uh, thing, then you see this is the background which is much higher. And background comes from, of course, from neutrinos because uh, quark anti-quark to Z, Z decaying to neutrinos and there is initial radiation from quark. So Z, so new, new jet, this is the background, which much higher than the signal. And, and the signal uh, uh, from say 100 GV, well, mu is roughly mass of dark matter, 100 GV dark matter and 500 GV dark matter. You can see the signal. So the background is much higher. But if you look at the shape, you can see very interesting thing. The shape of a PT distribution for uh, say dark matter with 500 GV is much uh, flatter than PT distribution of background, which is black. And this is exactly because I explained because invariant mass of dark matter in case of, um, uh, well, 500 GV dark matter, the minimal, is one TV, right? Because it, it cannot be smaller than twice mass of dark matter. For background, the invariant mass of neutrinos is Z boson mass. And it falls much uh, uh, steeper with PT of the monojet because of the reason I explained, because everything driven by kinematics. So the smaller invariant mass of background of two neutrinos uh, cause this uh, uh, quicker and steeper distribution, uh, quicker falling distribution. That's why uh, uh, we can distinguish dark matter from uh, background by, uh, well, exploring the shape and uh, making the very hard cut on PT or exploring just the shape. And in the end, we managed to do this and uh, the, the roughly speaking, well, that does, since I don't have much time, I just want to kind of show a result that you, we, we can probe dark matter well, not much, maybe up to 200 GV uh, 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 in the region where uh, direct detection does not cover. So, well, the, the xenon cannot cover small delta M's anyways. And um, this region can be covered with the LHC at high luminosity or discovered. So we, we're going slightly beyond left, but you can see that the current limit on dark matter mass produce, produced through the Z channel exchange, through the S channel Z diagram, is just 100 GeV coming from lab. This is, this is amazing. So dark matter can be around the corner, but we need actually still, we, there is a, we need to spend a lot of efforts to, uh, to, to discover it. Eventually we will. Now uh, I, I need to quickly move uh, because, uh, sorry, I, I was kind of, yeah, uh, w w well, a bit, bit slow, but uh, it is great. So if I don't cover everything I wanted to say, that's fine. I just, it's better, uh, I, I, I just deliver something which you, uh, well, something, some, something will be clear to you rather than rushing. <clears throat> I want to say that uh, this nice parameter space starting from effective theory ending by complete model, which is uh, created by Tim Tate, 
I would like to modify by important insertion. Uh, what is missing here is minimal consistent models, which is very important uh, to, uh, to be as a universal building block uh, for exploration of dark matter. And this is the key point. So we require that these minimal consistent models are gauge invariant, because you can see that there are some models, simplified models are not even gauge invariants, people invariant. They, people don't care where the Z prime mass come from. There are a lot of problems in the model buildings, but uh, re, you really would like to create a, build, a building block, which is good for SUSY or for other complete models. That's why you need to require gauge invariants, randomizability anomaly free, and uh, well, in the end, we arrive to uh, dark matter. We say that let's assume that dark matter is the weekly uh, is the weak multiplet, and there is one at least at most one multiplet of the mediator. That's why the there is a well there is a symbol for dark matter, and it's characterized by isospin and hypercharge. And if you plot dark matter and mediator in the table, so the along this axis. Horizontally, this is spin of dark matter, 0, 1, half, 1, and spin of the mediator against 0, 1, half, 1. And eventually, SUSY or MSSM is here in, in this block. So, but there are many different unexplored um, regions. <coughs> Sorry, uh, it's, not, it's not to appear, it's already appeared. So, I, I kind of uh, utilize slide, but I have a reference for our paper. So, it's or actually in the beginning, I mentioned this. So the simplest case when there is no dark matter multiplet, is it too simple or too bad? Actually, it's already quite, a, there are quite a lot of models and were we'll stressed by Chere, Chere Fernando Strumia a long time ago. And eventually the interesting case when uh, um, Y equal to zero, the hypercharge is equal to zero uh, for Dirac case, because if uh, hypercharge is non-zero then Dirac dark matter interacting with that bottom will be excluded by direct detection because it's very intense interaction and scattering. Another uh, interesting point about uh, this uh, dark matter multiplet that uh, at three level, everything is degenerate as required, a uh, mass degenerate is required by gauge invariance, but because of this diagram at loop level, there is a mass split between dark matter and charged dark matter guy. <coughs> And uh, well, uh, what I wanted to say that even uh, for zero uh, hypercharge means that dark matter does not interact with uh, directly with that boson. There are loop diagrams which can appear and can generate a non-zero direct detection rate. And some models, so for example, triplet Dirac mo model with zero hypercharge already being tested by Panda X. Panda X photon is actually is analogous to uh, its first results, uh, less than even one year, it is uh, analogous to Xenon one tone. So it's essentially, it's very close the result, slightly better, but very close to Xenon one tone. It's very new result. It testing, it, it is testing the, um, uh, this model, but uh, LZ collaboration will exclude this direct dark matter with zero hypercharge. There's several models. I just want to stress that uh, these diagrams can, uh, for uh, uh, for one loop induced diagram for direct detection can be very important. And we explored them in the recent paper, very recent paper. Well, one more message is that there could be some constellations between these diagrams. And, and we do observe constellations. For example, uh, for, uh, for this diagram, this is pseudo Dirac dark matter when uh, dark matter is a mass split between, uh, well, two Dirac components is, is split to two neutral uh, 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 Majorana components. So such that dark matter does not directly interact with that boson. And, but uh, there, there is a constellation uh, between, uh, well, these diagrams and such that uh, it can go below just below neutrino flow or and th this is important and if it goes quite below neutrino floor as Giovanna asked well uh, there is a problem because even direct detection uh, well uh, it, well direction of direct detection may be problematic if it's much further much much uh, uh, much below neutrino floor 
That's why uh, at this point, maybe colliders would play a very important role because collider production does not depend on this constellation. And collider signatures are very important and it comes into play. And uh, well, I, I'll skip this slide. I just want to kind of uh, mention that uh, when the mass split of dark matter is generated radiatively, uh, this, uh, well, the mass split is uh, between d plus and d zero in this multiplet is the order, order of pi and mass. So d plus decay to d zero d plus and uh, the charge com component, multiplet component of dark matter becomes long lived and it creates the disappearing charge track. Why? Because you create v, v plus or whatever, d plus, which lives say nanosecond or fractions nanosecond, and then it decay to d zero and pi plus. By pi, pi plus is pi and it's so soft, you don't de detect it. So this means that the signature looks like there is a charge track and which then disappear. And uh, we spent a lot of time on exploration and correct implementation of such a model because you need to implement correct double pi and mixing uh, to make it uh, to to have a correct interactions and uh, well Feynman diagrams generation because you write effective Lagrangian between um, well double and pi and mixing and put it in uh, uh, using the language actually pi and dark dark matter plus dark matter interaction this is the interaction and indeed it's very important if you don't do this you are wrong by one order of magnitude because this is the correct lifetime uh, and this is the wrong lifetime if you just calculate d plus v, uh, d0 w boson naively because uh, the whole point is that uh, w plus becomes very close to mass of the uh, mass of the fire and you cannot use just w uh, boson approach well, uh, I'm, I'm not going to discuss into really det many details. I just want to say that, well, this signature of disappearing charge track is very clean. And there are, you, you can produce chi zero, chi plus, or two chi zero, uh, chi plus, chi minus. So in this case, will be one disappearing track. In this case, will be two disappearing tracks eventually. And we, uh, well, we'll use all these tools like LANHEP, PFAIR, Delphes, all the stuff, reinterpreting Atlas result, and uh, just we'll, we'll skip. This is Atlas results limit on the lifetime of the dark of the charge guy, chi plus and chi plus mass. We took this uh, uh, limit together with efficiencies provided by Atlas, and we produced the limits on the vector, uh, scalar, and Fermion dark matter mass, which uh, with the limit can reach up to say 800 GV for vector dark matter, which is much better than monojet limit. I'm kind of rushing, but I, I know, well, the limit, I, I, need, I need to kind of, uh, well, uh, tell you a few more ideas on the dark matter decoding. One of the ideas is that if you go beyond, uh, and if you, if you add one mediator, then uh, you, 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 well, with one, say, uh, one mediator can be Fermion, then you will be uh, exploring uh, interesting and richer phenomenology. For example, if you have one more mediator, uh, uh, say you're adding, say, you cover interaction between dark matter doublet and singlet, you're already adding uh, D1, uh, well, two neutral components, D2 and D3, there are two, two neutral components, which lead to the multi lepton signature because you produce D plus together with D3, D3 decay into D2, and D, uh, D2 decay into Z, and you can have uh, quite a few leptons in the final state. Uh, at the LEC, it's nice signature. We went through this using Delphys and Checkmate, and uh, well, there are some uh, sensitivity to dark matter mass in terms of dark matter mass and delta M plus. Delta M, uh, delta M plus is the difference between dark matter and the charge guy. But you, you can still see that sensitivity to dark matter is over the order of say maybe 150, 160 GE. Again, dark matter can be around the corner, but well, we need to wait and maybe discover it soon. And uh, I will skip this because there are all details which I don't want to kind of spend time on this. One more thing, 
This is the beauty of uh, linear collider. So the role of ILC, uh, for example, which I don't know whether we will be realized or not, but it's just enormous because uh, it can, you can test the spin of dark matter from this process directly. So you plus or minus to d plus d minus. This is the well charged dark matter multiplied partner, say chi plus chi minus, which decays to dark matter and w plus w minus. What you need to do just to look at the uh, direction angular distribution of w plus and w minus, and you can see that the solid line is the w minus uh, uh, angular distribution for fermion dark matter. FDM is fermion dark matter solid line. And the dotted line uh, is the scalar dark matter. You see how they different. There's, there's a formula for this. I, I don't want to put formula and explain it, but it's it's related to the spin and, and the spin orientation. And all the distribution are very different from background because it's T-channel uh, background because of this T-channel diagram. Background uh, has a peaks forward and backward peaks, which so it's beautifully distinguished. So the, the this uh, distribution and collider can beautifully distinguish. Uh, spin of dark matter. And that's why we need to, uh, to have such precision machine. Now, finally, uh, we found the, and not only we, but also Alfonso and uh, his collaborator found the very minimal model where we have uh, uh, dark matter and pseudoscalar. So there are only two particles. A is the pseudoscalar, which is mediator, and psi is the dark matter. But in this model, this mediator A became also second dark matter component because it's accidentally uh, stable. This is, so the scalar becomes accidentally stable. This model is from this blob. Again, it was missed previously and the consistent classification allows to reveal such kind of models. And when you explore phenomenology of this model, I mean, I'm, again, uh, I'm just would be very quick. You can explore all, all this dark matter, et cetera. Well, uh, scattering, uh, but, one of the collider signature, and now also, of course, non-thermal, well, when, when the couplings are very small, you can explore non-thermal dark matter for this model. But uh, I just want to say that, well, when A and Psi uh, are not very heavy, uh, uh, then, okay, one second, uh, then uh, Psi, uh, uh, well, Higgs can de decay to psi dark matter via A loop. This is a loop induced process. And this can be tested even at the, uh, Atlas now or more significantly at the ILC. So the yellow tick uh, is the branching actually at per mill level can, can be probed at the, in the future and eliminate a lot of parameter space of the model. So this is the collider signature, which is related to invisible Higgs decay, which is loop induced. That's a very interesting. Well, uh, and uh, finally, this is my, uh, actually one of the last uh, slides. If, well, actually it's last. So the, what's the whole point? Decoding problem is the big problem because uh, the data to theory link is actually not explored yet. So this means an inverse problem is really something we need to think about because our goal is to discover and identify BSM. It's not just say, okay, I have a great model, it's observed. It can be observed, okay, sorry, it can be explored and there is visible signal. It's not enough. We need, actually need to be prepared now that the signal is observed in collider data and non-collider data, and we want to decode it. That's what we need to aim. Uh, well, because the, uh, say uh, bottom top approach is easy. You write Lagrangian, you simulate, and you say, oh, my model can be discovered. Yes, but the question is, let's think about opposite task. If there is some signal at the detectors, what actually model can be there? So that, that's why this is very cool and very important problem. So we created a HEPMDB, which is high energy uh, physics model database, which will be, can be very useful for this because it incorporates models, high energy physics models, and their signatures. We now creating database of signatures uh, for, for this. And this is public database, and you can upload your own model and you can uh, see what is there. 
Now, uh, my conclusions, I, I hope I am in, in time. Well, sorry for a bit kind of delay, but yes. So the point is that to decode the nature of dark matter, we need the signal first. Absolutely. We understand, uh, uh, well, we, we can understand now already using this especially systematic approach that what kind of dark matter is excluded. Uh, we, we can explore systematically parameter space. In minimal consistent dark matter models, which we advocate is a really good classification of the parameter space, consistent and very simple. And one can explore entire parameter space and make connection between experimental observations and parameter space. And, uh, and there are more, moreover, uh, there are few models which has not been explored yet. So, and you're welcome to see our paper and we'll see what is not explored yet. The problem in dark matter space uh, uh, can be done uh, using different uh, ways and uh, using the uh, disappearing track searches, multi lepton signatures at colliders, and uh, invisible Higgs decays. And uh, dark matter detection is sensitive to loop induced diagrams already. And uh, well, however, there could be some loopholes. For example, if there are some consolation, then collider will complement dark matter de uh, detection experiment. So sensitivity is highly dependent on mass split. Indeed, I didn't mention this, but we what we found that in the previous studies, when people calculate the loop induced direct detection diagrams, uh, they assume that there is no mass split between dark matter and uh, charge component, but this is important. I have some additional diagram, uh, additional plot, but I, I will not mention this. This is uh, well important point though. Well, and so we have a rich phenomenology and complementarity between collider and non-collider surges, and early density, of course. And uh, final point which I want like to make is the time to make a link between possible signals and models. So this link is missing and uh, it's time to work on this identification. So, and HEPMDB can be quite useful. So the idea is to combine all observed signatures and identify the BSM uh, model. And well, probably one of the best ways to think about uh, the, this game or whether this exercise on, for, for their uh, minimal consistent dark matter model uh, space to be done first. All right. Thank you very much. I'm done. Many thanks. Are there any questions from the audience? I was a bit rushing uh, to, towards the end. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> always okay. a, a kind of temp temptation to talk more, to tell you more information, but it can distract you from your questions. Uh, it was really comprehensive. So maybe I can ask you uh, something. Uh, before. Sure, of course. So, so I really like what you said at the end. I mean, it's like, are we really ready if there is some signal to be found uh, to, to understand the underlying nature or not? I think this is a very interesting question that we've also been posing in the LLP community as well. Uh, my question concerns this model database. I, I didn't realize this existed. So how, how in touch are you with the LHC working groups? So to sort of start of using this simplify well, model LHC framework. Working, LHC working groups, they aware about this. Uh, we, we're trying to convince people to store this because all communities can use it. And there are quite a lot of users of so the other 500 users for HEPMDB and uh, we're Basically, people upload their models there. Well, uh, I would say that uh, I still not satisfy uh, satisfy how intensive it's used, and the more it's used, the better, because we all uh, can develop uh, this database. It's, it's easy. You can you don't need to register to download model, and uh, you can register there anytime to upload your your own model. Moreover, uh, the HEPMDB allows to make a simulation for CalHEP and MapGraph using the model. So you choose the model, you make a simulation, you prepare LHE files, and then you, well, there the are quite a few experimentalists using this. 
well, maybe not enough, but you can you can use it HPC cluster, which is linked to this HFMDB. But our task is more ambitious now. We wanted to uh, involve machine learning and connect a model database with signature database mm -hmm. to uh, make some framework for identification of the underlying signatures at LHC. This is more ambitious, so the idea is to realize data theory link. And, but at the moment, you can go there, re register, and see what, what, what is there. So it's, it's, it's just, yeah. So, All right. so, so like you, you, your aim would be like something like a dark matter checkmate or, or something like that. I, I would say not necessarily even dark matter. Uh, well, uh, and not even checkmate. The idea is that, uh, uh, let, me, let me formulate this better. Um, checkmate has analysis which already incorporated there. Of course, we, we need to incorporate some analysis uh, there, but we were waiting for the signatures. Once the signature appear, we can put this in, into HapMDB and run through the whole space of theories. So it's nothing to do with checkmate. Checkmate incorporates analysis. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with the theory space. The idea is to identify what is the best theory which will describe signatures. A signature. So you need to classify the models according to signature space first. Yes. And of course, uh, there will be certain kind of libraries or whatever language or pseudo language of translating the uh, kind of experimental data in terms of uh, signatures and identifying the idea to run through the multidimensional space. Well, we have a theory space and each theory has a parameter space. So basically the idea is to run quickly uh, through the multi-dimensional space theory cross uh, parameter space. So it's like a product of two spaces and find actually which one best fit uh, and describe the signals which you would observe. So it's much more ambitious <laughs> than checkmate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand now, I understand, thanks. Yeah. And any other well, questions? You, you're, you're welcome to, to see what is there. So it's, uh, but uh, at the moment is the uh, theory database, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Sergei. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, uh, in your classifications of dark matter models, uh, you have various uh, 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 fields, uh, non-trivial in electroweak uh, group, uh, did you try to, uh, um, for example, this table? Right? Uh, yeah. their, excuse me. For example, this table I'm showing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But uh, some of them could uh, probably make an impact on neutrino mass generation. Uh, uh, th th this is this is good point. Uh, actually, uh, let, let me let me think about this. Indeed, uh, at a one loop level, you would uh, well. We consider, in fact, we consider as one of the model, even even, even this one, I mean, uh, with the one which, uh, let me see. Even this one with, with, with the simplest yes. one. Uh, in principle, through the uh, loop uh, or multi-loop or two-loop effect, like like a, some, I think it's like a, what, not champagne, but there was some model with the, like a champagne, uh, uh, oh, a cocktail model, <laughs> sorry, cocktail model. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, there could be some uh, 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 very similar effects like in cocktail models uh, uh, coming from the loop generation of the neutrino mass. Yes, that's true. We, and this is actually interesting point. We have some ideas uh, to explore on this subject, but we didn't do this. Yes, that's a very good point. Yeah, and this is cotogenic uh, uh, yes, sense. Cotogenic, you could, yes. uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, this is a very good point. And this, I mean, that's why we kind of present this classification to everybody so you can all play with yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's so good. and in fact, it's not very sophisticated. There are, there are, uh, well, particle and two indices, either spin and hypercharge. And uh, there are two uh, letters one is for mediator and another for dark matter. So basically, if there's no mediator, it will be one letter and two indices. There are, if there is a mediator and dark matter, there will be two letters and each one will, will have two indices. 
yeah. So it's like a minimal language you can you can do. This is really a minimal thing. And yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good point. That's that uh, indeed. Uh, there is a there is a power to explore uh, neutrino physics, and I, I wouldn't say that they uh, uh, exclude it uh, because you need to put some flavor. I mean, uh, and and flavor uh, well, and uh, they, they complicate this model by, by the flavor and mixing. But uh, that's a definite potential to explain neutrino mass through the loop effect. Do we have any more comments or questions? Well, if not, uh, uh, let's yeah. thank. I yeah? have a question if I may. Please go ahead, uh, Tessie. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, I was wondering about the scope of this uh, classification of Nakamura models, if it's restricted to WIMPs, GV, TV range. Or if uh, it applies also to a light dark matter, okay, uh, sub uh, sub GV very, very dark matter candidates. So, uh, th this is the example of uh, the parameter space scan. Uh, so we explore this model uh, up to say uh, ten GV. You can see that uh, well. If the model is uh, if the particles, for example, A is uh, quite light. It, well, it interacts with the Higgs boson uh, to provide a certain uh, amount of relative density, but it's immediately killed by invisible Higgs decay. So you can see, well, this is lines, which I didn't, well, I didn't have much time, but I just want to say that uh, these lines provide uh, uh, the sensitivity uh, and uh, to, the, uh, to the invisible Higgs decay. And and if lambda is large enough, it, everything is killed by invisible Higgs decay. Even now, the, the blue line is current limit. The uh, orange line, the limit will, will be maybe in five years. And this green line is ILC line. I don't know when it happened, but already blue line kills the uh, MA region, right? So, um, so possibility for very light uh, a, uh, the pseudo-scalar dark matter. Well, if I uh, look at uh, A psi, so the two dark matter candidates, Fermion and Scalar. So you can see that the uh, Fermion dark matter also excluded, uh, uh, well, in this particular model, of course, because if it's too light, the, uh, well, the, the, this annihilation will not work effectively because you need to annihilate to A Higgs, for example, or through the Higgs. So Higgs plays a role uh, of kind of um, guy which makes, requires Psi to be heavy enough. That's why in this particular model, uh, the uh, very light dark matter is, uh, does not appear, but it does not mean that it's always the case. And so, so uh, let me see. Uh, in principle, the minimal mass of, on, on dark matter is uh, roughly speaking half of the Higgs mass in this model. But uh, in general, you need to explore different, I mean, you need just take some models and explore them, right? So, and for this is example that uh, how relic density and invisible Higgs decay requires dark matter to be heavier roughly than uh, Higgs mass. That's what, well, that's, that's what it shows, yeah. I didn't mention this, but it's a very good question. So we, we I, I can highlight and maybe, uh, well, uh, some some uh, some plots like this, yeah. Thank Sasha, you. Okay. dark matter form is also in your classification, right? Say it again? <laughs> dark photon. Dark photon ah, is also a candidate. Oh, yes, uh, th this is a very good point. So no, the answer is no, because a dark photon requires new gauge group, dark gauge group. Here, sure. yeah, this, okay. this, this picture only for electroweak uh, doublet or electroweak multiplet. Everything is about either spin and hypercharge. Everything here is the for weakly interacting multiplet. Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a very good point. <laughs> so uh, the, thank you for your uh, actual remark. 
there's a, a dark dark gauge group open another space of the classification which is uh beyond this so basically another plane uh -huh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. but even with this simple weak a multiplet classification, you can see there are quite a few mm -hmm. models which are not explored. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. Excellent. So we, do we have any more questions? If not, let's thanks the speaker for this very comprehensive yeah. talk. Thank, thank you, you thank very you much. Thank you. I really, I really like it. Thank you.